There are many famous houses, turned museums, that hold the histories of brutal murders that draw thousands of tourists every year. You can walk in the steps of the murderer and you can tour the squeaky, history-filled floors. In some cases, the murder weapons are still there, encased in a glass box for you to gaze upon. Some of these houses have even been turned into immersive, sometimes haunted, bed and breakfasts. Not all of these murder houses still stand, however. There are many reasons that a house filled with such evil and despair have been erased from the world. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be going over these three murder houses that were demolished. Fred and Rosemary West's house. It's merely a path to a neighbouring street now, but the house that once stood at 25 Cromwell Street in England was formerly called the House of Horrors. Once the home of serial killers Fred and Rosemary West, the house was demolished when it became unstable after the numerous digs found the many murder victims of this husband and wife duo. Fred and Rosemary had a large, mixed and mostly dysfunctional family. Both were products of families that were ravaged with abuse and incest. It's no surprise that they continued that cycle. Rosemary was Fred's second wife, and probably his most matched. Between 1973 and 1987, the couple murdered a total of 12 people. It wasn't until 1994, however, that this whole plot was uncovered. Fred often threatened his other children with their dead sister's fate. He would tell them that she was under the patio and they would join her if they didn't do what he said. When this was leaked to authorities while investigating a separate abuse claim, the hunt for the missing daughter began. On the property, remains of nine bodies, including that of their missing daughter, were found buried under various spots in the house. They were found under a false fireplace, beneath the garage, buried in the cellar, and of course, beneath the patio. Fred and Rosemary were arrested immediately. Fred didn't make it to trial, however, hanging himself before it happened. Rosemary was charged and convicted with ten murders. She wasn't given the possibility of parole. Throughout the investigation, the house was reduced to an unstable shell, and it was ordered to be demolished by the city. The house wasn't just torn down, it was obliterated. In fact, you can't even have a souvenir brick if you're into those types of collectibles. Each piece of the house was ground down to mere dust in hopes of discouraging people from profiting off its remnants. The Petit Family Home If someone told you that your neighbour's house burned down, what would you think? Would you chalk it up to bad wiring or a cooking accident? Most of us would, but not for this family home as this wasn't the case at all. The home was burned down in the final steps of an elaborate grab for money by two skilled criminals. Joshua Komiskajewski and Stephen Hayes met in a halfway house in Hartford, Connecticut in 2006. Both had a history of home invasion, burglary and drugs. The two bonded over their similar past and kept in touch once they left the halfway home. Komiskajewski and Hayes both found themselves without steady work or income. After being idle for too long, the duo decided they had to go out and do something about it. Commissar Jevsky, the skilled burglar, laid out the plan to Hayes that involved burglarizing a house, tying the family of the house up in the car outside, and then burning the house down to destroy all the evidence. On July 23, 2007, the men carried out this plan on the Petit family. They broke into the home carrying a gun and baseball bat, and were first met with Bill, the family patriarch. After being beaten with the bat, Bill told the men there were no large sums of money kept in the house. Upstairs, the men tied up Bill's wife, Jennifer, and their two daughters, Michaela and Haley. They then returned to Bill and secured him in the basement. As they tore through the house looking for money and valuables, they found none, just as Bill had told them. They did, however, find evidence of $30,000 in the family bank account. A new plan formed in their head. The next morning, they planned to take Jennifer to the bank and have her withdraw for them $15,000. 
The next morning, Hayes went out and collected two cans of gasoline. He then returned to the house and collected Jennifer. Hayes took her to the bank and sent her inside to withdraw the money. Hoping to save her family, she did as she was told. However, the bank teller felt something was amiss, and so called the police. Hayes and Jennifer only barely made it back to the house before the police surrounded it. Hayes strangled Jennifer in the living room of the house. He then proceeded to cover her and the girls upstairs, still tied to their beds, in gasoline. Though both of them argue who actually did it, someone lit a match and set the house up into an inferno. Then, both men attempted to escape in the family car, only to be met by a police barricade at the end of the driveway. Firefighters couldn't make it to the house on time. By the time the flames were put out, all three girls inside were dead, Jennifer from the strangling, and the girls from smoke inhalation. Bill had made it out to a neighbour's driveway before the house was set on fire. When questioned about the events, neither Commissar Jevsky nor Hayes denied involvement. However, their reaction to the event varied immensely. Hayes consistently maintained he was initially in it for the money. He blamed Commissar Jevsky for the violence and for his outburst that made him strangle Jennifer. In the end, Commissar Jevsky fought for retrials, while Hayes never did. Not everyone perished on that day, however. Bill lives on, having left his previous occupation as a doctor, and he now runs a foundation in his family name. He'll always remember his family, but since the house is gone, he doesn't have to look at the reminder of the horrors they all endured ever again. The Bloody Bender's House Sometimes, truth is stronger than fiction. If we told you there was a serial killing, Old West family, murdering people beneath the trap door of their one-room cabin, you could say that sounds like a cheesy horror film. But those horror films get inspiration from somewhere. The Bloody Benders were perhaps the serial killers of the Old West. According to the Kansas Historical Society, the Benders came to southeastern Kansas in 1871. They settled near what is now Cherryvale in Labette County. The family consisted of John and Kate Bender, as well as their grown adult children, also named John and Kate. Here, they set up shop, converting their small cabin into a makeshift inn and shop for passing travellers. It seemed like your ideal family business, until travellers began to go missing. Nearby counties started to put pressure on Labette County, believing the travellers were all going missing in that area. Investigations deepened, and the townsfolk demanded answers. The Benders were initially suspected, but they weren't watched, and before long, the inn was abandoned. The property was immediately searched, and what they found inside the small cabin was much worse than they anticipated. A search of the home found it to be stripped of any personal belongings, however, the one-room cabin remained divided by a curtain. On the floor of the cabin, hidden under a bed, was an ominous trap door. A sick smell came from this door, which was nailed shut. Once pried open, the door revealed a small room, which was six feet deep. The room was about an eight by three room, and the entire floor was covered in congealed blood. In the roof of the cabin were several bullet holes, indicating the travellers may have tried to fight off the attack. An attack that was suspected of having happened from behind, with a hammer to the head and a knife to the throat before being dropped into the trap door. Throughout the Bender property, 11 bodies were found, all with smashed skulls and slit throats. There were various other body parts found, however, which brought the suspected body count to around 20. What happened to the Benders after the murders has almost become entwined with legend. There are tales of different vigilante groups catching them and reaping their injustice on them, though no one ever claimed the $3,000 reward that was placed upon their heads. Other stories said the younger John and Kate ran for the border, maybe disappearing into Mexico. Several women, therefore, were accused of being the mother and daughter. Several accounts of John put him murdering another man in Montana, or committing suicide in Lake Michigan. All of these have become folklore and tales, and there's not been a definitive answer on where the benders really ended up. So what happened to the house? Even in those times, word of the murder spread like wildfire. 
People came from all over to see the site where such vile happenings took place. The single room timber cabin didn't last long under all these visitations. It was rapidly destroyed by collectors, taking bit by bit with them to have a little piece of a crazy story all for their own. Just recently, the land the old cabin once stood on went up for sale. The auction manager claimed there were no further excavations on the land after the Bender property investigation. Would you buy this property? And if you did, would you continue digging? So what do you make of these three horror houses? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments section below, and help us by growing this community whilst working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.